Greetings. My name is Grant Lamy, and I work at the Steve and Cindy Rasmussen Institute for Genomic Medicine, which is part of the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Today, I'd like to talk about our journey in creating cutting edge genomic pipelines in the cloud. I especially want to talk about how we are running clinical cases and all the extra things that that involves. So this is the main tower of Nationwide Children's Hospital. The entire campus is, is very large. It takes up many city blocks. We're one of the biggest pediatric hospitals in the country and consistently ranked in the top 10 each year from US News and World Report. Um, but first, I, I kind of want to start by taking us way back in time a bit to 2016. Uh, you'll see that it was here that the executive leadership of the hospital, uh, they started working on their strategic plan for the next five years. And what that turned into uh, is something we call journey to best outcomes. And the general idea is that it serves as sort of our guiding star uh, about where we wanna take the hospital in the future. Uh, in particular, and what's especially important for this talk is that they wanted to greatly expand our genomics presence, uh, both on the research and clinical fronts uh, as what they call a key uh, accelerator. It's one of the yellowish orange dots there in the middle. And so to do that, that's what led to the creation of the Institute for Genomic Medicine. Um, it was a brand new center that was stood up and it had its own strategic plan. And what makes it kind of unique is that we want to do both genomics research as well as clinical genomics. So most places do one or the other that kind of thing. We felt that the research that we're doing into genomics, we could translate over um, directly for patient care, uh, in particular, pediatric patient care. So when in 2016, when this was first starting up, we, we really just had a small genomics core with a, a handful of people. And we knew that if we were gonna be this big strategic part of the hospital, we needed a bigger, bigger way to scale up. Uh, so first we needed to build a scientific structure um, to do this. And so what we did is we brought in two of the world's most renowned genomic scientists, the leaders, uh, Drs. Wilson and Martis. They've uh, long been involved with the research side of genomics. But one of the things that they really felt they wanted to do was bridge that gap to the clinical side. And so once they were on board, we really quickly were able to put together a lot more principal investigators, clinical directors, and all the kind of scientific brain power that we needed to do something like this. Uh, we also built up our entire wet bench laboratory system, and we set up all kinds of genomic sequencers to uh, physically transform DNA into data we can do. Um, but before I get too much further, I wanted to really give the world's shortest primer on what genomics is. Uh, it's a very new technology, and it's not something that a lot of people are really in-depth familiar with. So at the top of this screen, we see binary code, ones and zeros. This is the fundamental stuff from everything that runs uh, servers in the cloud to the cell phone in your pocket. It's the, the native language of, computer, of computers. So genomics is the programming language of us, of human beings, of anything that's alive. So instead of ones and zeros, a binary code, it's actually a four code. So A, C's, G's, and T's, the four basic amino acids those get turned into proteins, and then that builds everything uh, that the body needs to, to grow and to survive. The bottom two uh, are sort of a, a sample of what we would do with a cancer patient. So we would take and we would sequence some of their normal cells, so just blood or something like that, and then we would sequence their cancer, their tumor, and then we would compare the two, because that often tells us where the genomic problem is. So in this case, you can see that a G has turned into a C. And what's crazy is that's all it takes sometimes, just one letter being changed out of the billions that you have. Now, when I explain this, every year I go to, go to my kids' schools and I do a talk about this kind of thing, but to them, I explain it like this. So the two sentences here are really all exactly the same except for one comma, but that's a really important comma. Like, let's eat grandma, that's zombieism, right? But let's eat comma, grandma, that means it's time for Thanksgiving dinner. So it's kind of the same thing is when we're talking about genomics and the variants we see there. 
The other thing I do is, is a little exercise. So on the left, we have Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Um, it is not my favorite book. It is a book that I actually did not like at all when I had to read it in high school. So what I do is on the right, I have a completely shredded copy of Jane Eyre. I take that shredded copy out and I dump it on the table. And I say to the kids, okay, you have the rest of the time we have this presentation to put that back together so that it's a full book again. And then using the full book, the one on the left, look between the two, because they're two different editions, and tell me what the differences are. And then once you can tell me what the differences are, that's the things that we're interested in looking at. So that's kind of how genomics work. We have a reference, the one that's all together, and then we have the scrambled one that we have to put together like a giant jigsaw puzzle and then tell what's changed between the two. What's crazy, though, is the human genome isn't just one Charlotte Bronte book. It's a whole library. It's an enormous amount of data. So the reference we use is actually the Human Genome Project. This was something in the late you know, 1900s, which sounds very old now. Uh, scientists from all around the world worked and worked and worked and spent a bazillion dollars to reference a single human genome. And once that was done, we can use that as a comparison with everything else that we do. So in the lab, this is a, we don't have to understand the science of what's going on here, but each of those fragments are little pieces of DNA. And this is all done on the wet bench. And it flows through this process where we get down to the lower right-hand corner. You can see the T, A, G, and C stacked up on each other. It's kind of like pictures of Swiss cheese. So you layer Swiss cheese on top of each other. You can see the holes all the way through. And you hope if you have enough pictures that you can get a full view of the puzzle. This is kind of a, a shot of it from, you know, that a side of that Swiss cheese. We have the, the reference on top, and then we stack up all those little red lines. And then if we were to turn it 90 degrees, we should be able to see all the red lines over the, Jeff, the reference sequence, and then we can tell the differences between the two. All right, so that's genomics in a nutshell. So now how are we gonna do all of this in the real world? How are we gonna build out this institute? How are we gonna do everything we want? Um, and it's no small undertaking and we had to make some really important technology decisions. And we knew no matter what sort of technology we chose, we had to be able to run this clinically, which has a whole bunch of special requirements like HIPAA and privacy around it. So we knew we had to build something. Um, Genomics is incredibly resource intensive. Uh, we need massive amounts of compute power and even more massive amounts of storage space to keep everything. And But at the same time, we knew we wanted to be nimble because remember, we wanna take our research, the things that we're discovering, and we wanna put that into a clinical setting. So we want something we can move quickly on, but we also had to have rock solid, rock solid security. So it's like many things coming together. Now, in a normal engineering talk or something like this, I'd start showing boxes and lines and, and technical details. Um, but for this, we have to go somewhere else first. And that's, we need to talk about security. And this is the key challenge that we face as an organization because without having this worked out first, there was no way we would be allowed to do clinical genomics in the cloud. End of story, the, the risk would be too much. So I think a good way to understand uh, why security was so important to us and what we did to address it was sort of these six tenets that we live by. Um, and we'll kind of use these as a scorecard for some of our technological solutions I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so genomics is protected health information, PHI, always use encryption, log audit and review. The most secure data is the data that doesn't exist. The most secure server is the server that doesn't exist. And then number six, we'll get to that one. That's the most important one. So protected health information, PHI, is the kind of thing that you traditionally think of as quote unquote health data. So that's like the diagnosis from your doctor or medications you're taking. And that's all tied together to your medical record. And that identifies those things as belonging to you. So Genomic data is literally the blueprint of who you are, that it is that simple. Not only does it uniquely identify you as an individual, 
but it also holds all kinds of secrets about ailments that you currently might not have, but you could be susceptible to someday. So, like, in the movies, you see heroes, like, they'll steal a lock of hair uh, off of some bad guy, and they'll stick it into some little handheld gizmo, and then, like, a few seconds later, they'll have, like, a full dossier of it, like, all the bad things he's done. So, we aren't at this level of science fiction, but we're actually closer to it than we are farther away. And so, because of that, we have decided, as an institution, to treat genomic data as PHI. Number two, uh, this is always used encryption. And this isn't really anything unique to genomic processing. It's really all modern secure or modern computing systems should do this. Uh, but regardless, we always encrypt everything in transit. Uh, we encrypt everything at rest. And then we use different encryption keys for different data sets. So only people with access to the correct keys can get at the certain data. Uh, I particularly actually like this this picture that we have from the hospital because you can see that little dude is encrypted as blocks. They're all they're all mixed up. So network encryption means HTTPS everywhere, and it means making extensive use of VPC security groups and WAF firewalls. And then disk encryption is something we use across the board, um, whether it's with our EBS block storage, all those are encrypted, or EFS mounted shares or S3 buckets themselves, which is the, the bulk of what we do. Um, and then plus KMS allows us to designate those different encryption keys for the different kinds of data and then associate those keys only with users or roles that need them. This kind of thing really helps that it's all built for us. We're not monkeying with it, trying to custom encryption solution. It's there out of the box that we can just set up and go with. Uh, number three, log, audit, and review. So we log everything. We keep track of who or what is accessing what data. And then the most critical part of this, it's easy to log things, but you have to review those logs and audit. So collecting the data is not enough. It doesn't do you any good just to store it somewhere. You actually have to look at it and gain insights and make sure everything's where it should be. Uh, and then the only way to do that is with some kind of automation. So for that, um, different things like CloudWatch, alarms, guard duty rules, security hub standards. All, we use all of these things to keep an eye on what's going on uh, in our cloud. And then notifications are set up on those automatically to, pro, you know, to send things to the appropriate people if something doesn't look quite right. Um, this automation is so important as you get more and more users and more and more data in the system. Uh, Plus, it doesn't really add any overhead. It's the system never sleeps. It's just always there watching, which is really great. Uh, number four, the the most secure data is the data that isn't even there. And again, these aren't things that are unique to genomics uh, and are more standard security practices. But it's really only storing the data you need and and de-identifying and storing is based sort of on the decisions of your software. Right, so since we're research, we, we use some of the genomic data that we um, collect as sort of an aggregate so we can get counts and things like that, but it's completely de-identified from who it was because that's not important for those kind of things. And then we extensively use IAM um, for really, really fine-grained security policies that keep the correct systems and correct people looking at the data. Um, we always start with the least access principle in mind. It takes longer to build up your policies that way rather than just attaching a full access or a star or something to it, but it's a lot it's a lot safer. We've even gone so far as to treat the AWS root account, the one that can close your account, like the launch keys on a nuclear submarine. So no one person has the password and the hardware MFA token needed to log in. Only when a combination of two or more people are together, watching what is being done together, can we actually do anything with that account. Uh, number five, which is kind of similar to number four, but with a kind of fascinating twist, is that the most secure server is the server that doesn't exist. Uh, one of the things that I like the most about AWS, and one of the things that we have really invested a lot in is serverless technologies. Um, if when you're trying to, to design a solution and you leverage serverless as much as possible, 
a whole category of worries sort of go away. So I don't want to worry about patching servers and following exploits and, and that kind of thing. That's all offloaded onto the AWS teams that are doing that for a living every single day. That frees us up for more time to do science, which is what we want to do. Um, this is super powerful, the serverless stuff. And we were super lucky to be able to start from here. Uh, deconstructing existing applications to be serverless, it can be a pain, but it is worth looking into. Now, the thing I teased earlier, the number six, the single most important one, if you want to move your clinical workflows to the cloud, is to work with your institutional security team. Okay? So, as much of each of us sort of in our own head thinks of ourselves as the center of the universe, it's actually not really true. The security team exists for a real reason, and that reason isn't to personally make your life difficult. So these guys at a hospital, they really have a near impossible job if you think about it. For a hospital of our size, really, really big one, there are tens of thousands of computer systems from data centers to individual exam rooms that they would have to worry about all the time. So it's important to work with them as much as you possibly can. So a lot of times as developers, I speak for myself here too, you sort of, your gut reaction to InfoSec is something like you wanna sneak around or you wanna to get your latest thing in the production or you, or you don't wanna focus on that because it's a pain or there's hoops to jump through. This is 100% the exact wrong way to go about it. So while they're wary of new and unproven solutions, if you do your job to prove to them that what you wanna do is sound, you're golden, okay? And so what that means is answer every single question they ask, go into more detail than you think is necessary, provide every scrap of documentation they want. Uh, if it's forms and security surveys for risk for that and assessing risk, fill them out. Proactively show them your new designs, don't wait until you're ready to deploy, and then be the best that they see. Own it. Security is totally your problem. Um, we found that our InfoSec team, uh, they have a whole bunch of security surveys that you sort of fill out, and it forces you to answer questions about what you're doing. They take some time to do, but it kind of lets you step back and look at the whole instead of little bits and pieces. And this is really a, a good way to look about it. And then we also do stuff like we meet with them regularly, you know? It's it's not something where we show up every now and again and drop a new idea on them. No, it's a, it's a recurring cadence. And they have a wider view of your organization than just what you're doing. And you can get a lot of insight out about that. It really is, I mean, as corny as it sounds to say, it really is a partnership and that's how you have to approach it. Um, this all reminded me of, of something that Jocko Wilnick talked about in his book, Extreme Ownership. And I can't really stress how right he is, especially for what we were trying to do. Once we proved that we owned everything, that we took responsibility for everything, that's when we had success getting things deployed. All right, so now to our system, we've got our security in place. What did we end up building and how did we leverage these principles? So. At a basic level, this is what happens clinically. A patient visits their doctor, the doctor thinks that maybe there is some genetic cause for their ailment, and they order a test. Blood sample or tumor sample is processed by an extraction team and the DNA is isolated. The DNA is prepared for sequencing, and then it's put on these uh, machines called sequencers I talked about earlier that, that transform the DNA into actual data the computer can work with. That data is then analyzed in the cloud and a list of the patient's genetic variants is generated. So this is like diffing the two and the, this is the, the differences. So by themselves, those differences aren't all that great. You need information about whether they are uh, pathogenic or if they're benign. Um, you need to know if they're important. So the genetic variants are then assessed by scientists and lab directors and custom software we've written to, to pick out the things that are important. They then write a report, which is delivered to genetic counselors that can go over the results with the patient and the, and the doctors. So for us, we're just gonna sort of focus on three, four, five, and six. Those are the, our computational ones right now. So our first step, which is number three, this happens in the lab where technicians are preparing the, the DNA for sequencing. So 
not only do they need to um, work at the wet bench, you know, doing the actual chemistry to extract the DNA, but they need some way to record what they're doing. So all the downstream software knows what it's for. And so for that, we utilize an application that we call IGM Seek. Uh, this is something that we had actually developed in house before we even had anything in the cloud. It's a, uh, a Django web app. And it's something we found that we could move to the cloud in your classic lift and shift sort of way, but then start using new cloud services with it to make it better. Um, all the white arrows that you see, that's all encrypted communication. And all the storage services that we use, those are all encrypted at rest. So we could even retire some of the servers that we were using for databases because we could go with Aurora, which is a managed service. Um, also, everything here is, is role-based. So the lab techs, they only really need to know the stuff that's happening in the lab, whereas the variant scientists need to have a much bigger picture. They can use the same system, but we apply the roles to them so people only see what they need to. So if we kind of look at our tenants and our scorecard, everything is checks. The server doesn't exist. This isn't 100% serverless because we do have some web and app servers, uh, but everything else is, and that's really cool. Uh, our second step, which is step four, is sequencing the DNA on the sequencers. Um, and we have a whole bunch of them, ranging from really small desktop ones to ones that are a little bit bigger than a refrigerator. So the data comes off of them and it is processed through an application we call IGM Primary. Now, IGM Primary, his job is to take the raw data that comes off of those sequencers and transform it into a data that the downstream bioinformatics tools can understand. Um, what's cool about him is we've designed him from the very beginning to be 100% automated and 100% serverless. We've also clinically validated him. So every single one of our clinical samples goes through this guy, along with our research samples. All the same encryption and encryption in transit, encryption at rest, all that is still there. This is a really great example of an application with a role that is very well defined. So he runs automatically, there's no user interface to him, and he can only have rights to the stuff that he has to do, no more. So when we look at the scorecard for this guy, checks all across the board, everything's good there. Step five, this is where we get into the what the genomics world calls secondary analysis. And, and so what this means is it takes all those ACs, Gs and Ts from the sequencer data, and he puts together that giant jigsaw puzzle. Um, this is enormously computationally expensive, as you might expect it to be, to find out what those mutations are. So to do this, uh, we're using a system we call Churchill, and it too is 100% serverless. All the same security, encryption, all that's in place. And without any of those permanent servers around, it really cuts down like an attack vector. There's just, there's no server to hack into and there's no server. Uh, plus this design is really incredibly flexible on a couple of fronts. One, we have nearly unlimited scale. So we can process as many samples as the labs and sequencers throw at us. This leads us to quicker turnaround time and quicker results to the patient. And then we can also add new kinds of analysis or improvements to existing ones. So if our research comes up with a new way of detecting large structural changes or situation where genes fuse together, we can just plug those components into an existing workflow. So a really great example of this too uh, is something that we've just done very recently. We have a, a research project for endometrial cancer and Lynch syndrome uh, associated with Ohio State University. And part of our clinical pipeline was uh, processing these, these cancer samples and looking at a very, very narrow set of genes just for these things. But then there was some idea, it's like, well, maybe we can look at this from a research point of view as well to see if there's anything else interesting going along with it. So what we did is we, we created a new system that's based on event bridge. So we didn't even have to touch our clinically validated pipeline. We just waited for the step function events to come through, check to see if this sample was approved for research. And then if it is, process it as a cohort so that we can see a wider range of the genomes. And we did that you know, in a few days. It's really amazing what can be plugged in like that. So for Churchill, the six tenants, again, 
all checks across the board. Everything's going well there. You can see a common pattern, you know, in the, how the, the icons are spread out. Uh, like step functions really is the key to coordinating everything. We use them a lot. We use batch to do long running jobs. So you can plug these blocks together in a way that's really, really more than the sum of their parts. So our last computational step, number six, this is where we take our diff results, our, our list of variants, and we annotate them with the latest data from dozens of annotation databases. So this is where we, we decorate the results with research from um, other institutions, other places that say, okay, this, this mutation in this gene is pathogenic or, or this one's harmful. And this is how we know if we found the cause of the, or we can find the cause of the kiddo's disease. To do that, we've created a, uh, an application called Varhouse, which is a serverless solution for tertiary analysis. And again, every line is encrypted, every box is encrypted, and we can really handle any load with this, which is really great. Uh, since we de-identify everything, we can do some interesting research on things. We have a giant S3 data lake that this all fills into. Um, EMR, in particular here, has really become the cornerstone of our house. So rather than have like one giant Hadoop Spark cluster that's running all the time and costing money, we use loads of short-lived spot-based instance clusters that come up, do their work, and then go away constantly, all the time, um, doing Spark jobs. And it, it, really, it really works out great. And then again, for this one, six check marks, everything's, everything's all good. So in production today, in a clinical situation, we do thousands of clinical exomes and panels every year. It's actually happening. And so to review, like we've learned along the way that it really pays to go through a serverless lens, but also through a security lens. Like doing those two in combination have really opened up a lot of doors from us. And then it just kind of keeps feeding onto itself because we can add new things, the security is well known, and we can add new processes and it, it really, it just keeps growing and snowballing. This is really just the beginning though. Um, you can see all those things listed underneath it, the cancer protocol, the rapid genome sequencing, rare disease. All of these things are research that we're doing now that will be moved into clinical use someday. And you can just see the, the wide variety of things we'll be able to offer to the hospital. And that's really what it is all about, right? For us, it's about real kids across the street and coming up with real solutions to treat them. Um, I can say for, for all of us that this is the most rewarding work that we've ever done. And so just before I close, one, one final thought, um, sort of thinking about our journey, how we've gotten here. Dr. John Barnard is the president of the Research Institute. Um, and he had a series of tweets where he was kind of showing pictures of where he worked. And this one uh, is a picture from one of our towers. You can see that blue line on the floor. It's, it's a wayfinding tool. So you say to someone, it's like, follow the blue line to the green line, and then you'll get to radiology, that kind of thing. But you'll notice it's not, it's not straight. It's like a wavy line. And so what you'll notice when you go over to the hospital, it's like little kids love to walk directly on the blue line. And then adults sort of subconsciously do it. They, uh, grown adults, myself included, will follow it just because we used to be kids at one point. And so I replied back to him, it's like, hey, do you find yourself doing that? And he's like, absolutely. And if you let it, it'll pull you along like a lazy river. And honestly, I thought that was a really wonderful analogy for what we've done with security and clinical and cloud processing that a lazy river has twists and turns, but you will get to the end of it. Um, and it's definitely worth the ride to get there. So thank you all very much.